so anyway, thank you all for being here for our Innovator Seminar. I would like to introduce Dr. Monica Barra. She is an assistant professor in the School of Earth, Ocean, and Environment, Environment and Department of Anthropology at the University of South Carolina. She is a cultural anthropologist and uses ethnographic and other qualitative methods to examine the relationship between racial inequality, science, and climate change. And uh, she'll be presenting today, and I'll turn the floor over to Monica. Thank you so much, Monica. Thanks. Yeah. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. All right. Thanks. And thank you for that introduction, Cassie. All right. So I've been told I cannot move past about this point for the web thing, so I'll be, like, somewhat behind this. Um, but anyway, I want to, first of all, thank you all for being here. Um, it's super fun to be able to talk about some of the things that I think a lot about in my research. Um, and I'm curious to kind of hear folks' questions and feedbacks and engagements on things. Um, so I'm gonna try and keep this a little bit brief, so I'm not going for an hour and a half long lecture. Um, but, um, but I did wanna leave us some time for, for discussion as well, so I'm aiming for about 30 minutes or so. Um, and again, I want this to be more of a informal, I guess, seminar style, so if you have questions or thoughts, raise your hand say something, I don't mind being interrupted um, as I go through this. Um, anyway, the topic that I want to discuss today is roughly what I call situating knowledges, right? And for those of you familiar with work in science and technology studies or STS, the reference to Donna Haraway's work should be familiar, but for those of you who have no idea what I mean by STS, situated knowledge, or Donna Haraway, I'm going to talk a bit about how this concept that she developed in her writing in the 1980s called situated knowledge can be pretty useful, I think, um, for thinking about work across disciplines concerned with climate change and its relationship to society, and in particular, what it means for those of us interested in studying climate change with an eye towards confronting its uneven impacts on the most vulnerable segments of our uh, human settlements, I think as we call them here. Um, so I want to follow this up by discussing some of the um, methods that have been used by social scientists to better understand and integrate things like diverse environmental knowledges into environmental research broadly, but climate change research specifically. Um, and I'll suggest that these methods are not only about better communicating climate change science, but rather are also about addressing the different power dynamics implicated in the divide between people and scientists um, with an aim of producing scientific knowledge that can reflect the needs values and expertise of more than just scientists, right, especially in the context of trying to do science for uh, different kinds of communities. So with that in mind, I always like to talk a little bit about uh, where I'm from. Um, I know most of you already kind of know that in the room, but just kind of a brief overview, right? So I'm a cultural anthropologist and geographer. I have a multidisciplinary background in the social sciences and humanities. Uh, I specialize in issues around racial inequality, science, and environmental change. Um, Topic-wise, I roughly fall into a couple of subfields uh, within the field of anthropology, critical race studies, science and technology studies, environmental anthropology, and anthropology of the US. Over the past five years, my primary research has been located in South Louisiana. Um, so if any of you are familiar with you know, the state here, we got its little boot. New Orleans is right up here, and this is the predominant um, county or parish that I worked in. Um, I focused on understanding the relationship between coastal land loss, restoration science and engineering, and historic and contemporary racial inequalities in the region. In a nutshell, my research argues that much of the innovation around riverine and coastal science and engineering, be it for the 19th century plantation, flood control in the 20th century, or coastal restoration at the current moment, has in large part been enabled through political inequalities in Southern society broken down along the lines of race and class. In this regard, I argue that science is interrelated with society in ways that often come at the expense of historically marginalized groups. And this is a topic of which I'm currently working on a, um, a book proposal for. Um, for this research, I conducted participant observation or ethnography among scientists working in the coastal restoration field and with residents from several of the black and mixed race communities living in the path of Louis some of Louisiana's most ambitious projects to restore sinking coastal land. And for those of you who don't know, Louisiana has been losing land at a rate of, everybody likes to say, a football field per hour since the 1930s. Um, so it's a topic of much um, interest at the, at the current moment. Um, so rather than just working between these groups, right, rather than trying to replicate a kind of resident 
scientists um, divide in my work, uh, I spent time with both communities, almost three years of field work, trying to grasp how individuals in both of these groups understand the relationship between science, racism, land, and water, and how each of these groups encounters each other. Right? So a lot of time at public meetings, for those of you who've done ethnography, um, that's no surprise. Um, this left me with a pretty rich ethnographic portrait of the ways that science, society, and environmental restoration are converging on this canary in the coal mine, coal mine if you will, case of, of sinking Louisiana. Um, so just a bit about what participant observation ethnography is. Um, approaching my research as an anthropologist and ethnographer was a, a key methodological and ethical imperative for me, and I just want to say a few things about that. Um, in general, anthropology is interested in the study of human culture, past and present, and our primate relatives, which is why I have colleagues who are archaeologists, as well as folks who study um, bones and monkeys. <laughs> um, but anthropology, and especially social cultural anthropology, is most importantly about understanding cultural difference. And this is where ethnography's aspiration to understand another person or people's world from the so-called inside out stands out, I believe, amongst other qualitative methods in its attempt to cultivate a kind of radical empathy for groups and situations foreign to us. And by us, I mean the anthropologists or ethnographers. To me, anthropology embraces messiness or the kind of noise of cultural difference and, and encounter between different groups. And at its best, it works to translate cultural differences, such as those between hydraulic modelers and engineers and community leaders from small black churches in the rural south, which is a lot of the work that I did. Another thing that anthropology does pretty well, in my opinion, is to think about power, and in particular, the power dynamics between researchers and research subjects as it's wielded through the process of representation, right? So as researchers, as anthropologists, we're always kind of called up to speak about our objects of study, right, to represent people. And anthropologists have spent a lot of time critically thinking about our relationship to our subjects or our interlocutors and about our own positionality as researchers in that relationship um, in terms of how we represent them and how we represent ourselves, right? So a lot of the work we do is also trying to account for our presence in the work that we conduct. In other fields, this might be considered talking about bias. Um, but for cultural anthropologists, there's really no thing as an outside or a separation between us and our objects of study, which is why it doesn't tend to get into a conversation about bias as much as you might find in other, in other disciplines. And the choices that we make about the questions we ask, the data we collect, the analytic frameworks that we use, all critically situate the kinds of conclusions that we make, right? They contextualize how we draw conclusions about the problems we're studying or the groups of people we're looking at. Um, and of course, for me, this is actually part and parcel of the kind of impulse and desire to also understand the kind of practice of science, if you will. Um, so that kind of background in my disciplinary training, again, really kind of set me up, I think, to be intrigued by studying science as this kind of cultural object of study. Um, and diving into more of this kind of idea of what it means to situate or contextualize how we think about knowledge production and the different dynamics that go into that between researchers and our subjects. So, let me see here. So, the imperative to study how others see the world is what let me, led me to an interest in the production and circulation of scientific knowledge and scientists as an ethnographic object of inquiry. This was less an attempt on my part to deconstruct science, but rather a way to take seriously the role that expertise and scientific knowledge plays in producing social relations. I find this interesting in places where climate change, particularly sea level rise or more erratic weather events, um, is increasingly becoming translated into policy. Though not everywhere, climate change science is in many ways touted as a political, value-free, or an objective endeavor. In Louisiana, a large part of the public representation of its investment, financial and otherwise, in coastal land loss and restoration science and planning is that it is science-based. You hear this a lot in public meetings around the state about coastal restoration planning and science. Um, it's uniquely... It's usually used to kind of distinguish how it's uniquely positioned outside of politics as usual, which in Louisiana 
is an important distinction to make um, as, as a state with a, an interesting political history, um, to say the least. The idea or the impulse to kind of situate science outside of politics rests heavily on this notion of objectivity, right? Which bolsters the authority that scientific research creates and in turn the authority that the efforts of planners who are kind of mobilizing this science use to justify and try to gain public acceptance of the plans that they're using for coastal restoration and planning activities. Rather than taking objectivity or the non-politics of coastal restoration at face value, however, I wanted to learn more about how this objectivity and expertise about coastal land loss and restoration is produced and contested. Frameworks from feminist science studies led me to these conceptual questions and ultimately influenced many of my methodological uh, decisions. So just a few things about what a, a kind of science studies framework kind of brings to the fore. So one of the primary ideas that I aim to complicate in my own research is what feminist science studies scholar Donna Haraway describes as this, quote, gaze from nowhere that's reproduced in conceptual frameworks and methods of the hard sciences or Western scientific inquiry. For her, this centers on the idea um, of the aspiration to objectivity that is foundational to modern Western scientific inquiry, right? This idea that science can kind of be separated from its results, right? Which is why we've developed things like the scientific method, peer review, all these other kind of mechanisms we as scientists use to do this. Writing in the 1980s, um, Haraway, who's a biologist and a scholar in the field of science and technology studies, was looking for a way to incorporate a critical focus on contingency, difference, and power in the production of scientific knowledge. This was not necessarily a project of revealing bias in science, per se, or separating good science from bad or misused science. Rather, her project was to figure out a way to produce a science or scientific objectivity while also acknowledging that the production of science itself is always what she terms embodied, right? That is, it doesn't come out of nowhere. The God trick, as she often describes it in her writing, but that knowledge is always situated, right? She talks about kind of putting flesh, if you will, on the body, right? Remember, this is kind of in the context of the 1980s, so it's a little bit, you know, in that moment um, of the science wars and the kind of second wave into third wave feminism, but that's another story. Um, this kind of science, she argues, is not about transcendence outside of the world of the lab or the field site and the context of scientific knowledge's production, but rather enables us to think about, sci or think about our practices or enable scientists to think about how to produce a richer and more textured picture of the way objectivity or scientific knowledge or facts are produced. Um, for her, the metaphor of vision is really apt here, right? The God trick, the view from nowhere, right? From where and how we see in order to be able to account for difference and ultimately power in our analyses of science, right? Because a lot of the authority that science wields usually rests on the fulcrum of objectivity, right? This kind of separation, again. All our visions are partial, her work argues, and in acknowledging this, objectivity is always partial. We do not stand apart from the knowledge we make, but are always situated or implicated within it. And these are just a few quotes from her article from 1988. For her to practice science in an acknowledgement of kind of situating our knowledge, right, um, is to open up, well, let me back up. This idea, feminist objectivity is about limited location and situated knowledge, not about transcendence, right? So for her, it's not an abandonment of the possibility that we can produce objective, rigorous scientific knowledge, but that a way of doing that, we need to also acknowledge the fact that we are situated, right? We're not standing outside of those things, right? For her, this reformulation of kind of what science is and how we can do science a little bit differently is about also foregrounding questions about responsibility and accountability and ultimately, really, these point to questions about power, right? Who can speak for whom and what does that do in the world? Um, and for her, it's really about opening up a space to talk about that. And then from there, how does that inform how we do our practices differently? Um, so again, who's able, who's enabled to see in the scientific world, right, and speak for reality? And whose knowledge counts, right? These are the kinds of questions that come out of that framework, right? And 
she's not the only person that writes about this. There's a very large field, which I don't, you know, we can talk about if you want to learn more about it. But, um, but I think it's pretty important. And, you know, Haraway is, I think, a pretty key figure here. Um, so in the context of my field site in South Louisiana, where scientific knowledge was taking up a very powerful role in defining the present and future of coastal residents, I found these frameworks complementary to my interest in understanding the culture of science and trying to get a wider picture of how science and society are entangled, right, or connected with one another. But more than this, I also read Haraway's and others' work like her as an imperative to take seriously the question, again, of whose knowledge counts and to explore ways to cultivate coastal land loss and restoration knowledges across divisions of expertise and difference. Right. So, next section, I'm going to go into this multiple knowledge thing, right? So I'm certainly not the only person to think about these questions, especially in terms of how we take these concepts or these theories and apply them to our methodologies, right? So social scientists have approached these questions of situating scientific knowledge and accounting for multiple knowledge, not solely defined by Western science in a variety of ways, particularly in the fields of environmental and climate change-based research, right? So I'm sure many of you are familiar with traditional ecological or environmental knowledge, right? This is basically aimed at looking, taking kind of knowledge forms from non-scientific backgrounds. So usually this is associated with doing research with indigenous communities, um, non-science groups, right, which is, it's usually kind of conceptually framed in difference to Western scientific knowledge by focusing on observation base, but what's passed on in terms of knowledge about the environment via different cultures, multiple generations, focuses on idiosyncrasies as opposed to generalizations, which, of course, we know that science is usually about generalizability, um, and presents a different kind of repertoire of knowledge about the environment as well as environmental change. Um, many anthropologists who do environmental anthropology tend to use this, um, as many of our colleagues, I think, here at NCAR do as well. Um, citizen science, I think, also kind of falls within this, right? So in a nutshell, kind of non-scientists using scientific methods to, to collect different forms of environmental data, right? And these can be motivated for a variety of reasons on the part of communities. Some of the kind of classic reasons why is for communities trying to document and fight excessive pollution, air and water and things in their community when policymakers or scientists don't seem to be uh, paying attention to it, right? The next is uh, participatory action research, which is research that is used by social scientists, many of whom kind of work with historically marginalized communities, right? And this is about designing research with research participants from basic questions to methods to sample sizes and really collaborating on every level with the people you are doing research with. Um, Certainly not an easy method to, to execute, um, but it's something that also really, maybe more squarely than some of these other methods, um, tries to break down those hierarchies between researchers and subjects, right? Um, and it's really also based on this idea of kind of reciprocity in research, right? So how can we do research in a way that isn't extractive, is, is a word you'll hear a lot of social scientists use, um, but actually can kind of give back to and or acknowledge the needs of communities, right? So resonating with the work of Haraway and other feminist science studies scholars, these efforts to redefine what or who creates objectivity um, aims to really break down hierarchies between, again, different kinds of environmental knowledges. Explicitly and tacitly, these practices embrace objectivity as situated knowledge. By doing so, they produce science and planning documents that reflect the values of the people impacted by things like climate change science, or what are do things along the lines of what anthropologist Julie Maldonado calls developing multiple knowledge approaches to making science, or at least they aspire to do so, right? The wider goal here is to make science responsive to the needs of communities impacted by client, climate change and the communities that client, climate change science aims to serve. This has been crucial in the context of producing data and ultimately planning documents that siphon millions of dollars into one project or another um, has, has been crucial to this in the context of climate change, especially for indigenous, African-American, poor, and other politically, geographically marginalized communities that are bearing the brunt of climate change and its future impacts. Um, so. Question. 
Yeah, uh, go ahead. I, I, sorry. We're going to use a microphone just so that people online can hear us. Um, I was wondering if these different approaches can be combined mm. and if they are often combined in research. I think that's a good question. Um, I think you could. Uh, you know, I've, in, in many ways, a lot of it kind of depends on what the project is looking at. Um, so I'm not, not specifically in research, in, in reference to my research, but I have colleagues who've worked in Louisiana who've done a kind of hybrid of a citizen science TEK project where they, they did these things called TEK mapping, where they... Um, Researchers from LSU went out with a number of indigenous communities in coastal Louisiana, and were talking with them about various restoration projects around the communities they lived in, what they thought was working, and then where uh, indigenous residents thought certain kinds of restoration projects could be. And they were using um, geolocated GIS kind of technology to actually physically map these areas as they were kind of out in a boat running around the marsh and doing those things. So to me, that's kind of an interesting hybrid of kind of using the tools of more traditional science, but also trying to use that as a way to document traditional ecological knowledge. And, and part of that is a kind of interesting translation factor, right? Because the idea, it was actually research commissioned by the Coastal Restoration and Protection Authority, which is the state agency that oversees all coastal restoration and protection planning in Louisiana. Um, and the idea was to be able to document that knowledge in a way that was legible to the state and state planners. Um, so that's one example I can think of. Um, but I wonder if there are others, maybe other folks have done similar work. I'm not sure in the room, but I think there are ways to do that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No. It's a cool project. I should yeah, send that around with really folks. Um, yeah. So anyway, with this work in mind, um, I worked with residents and scientists in Louisiana to do a, another kind of version of these kind of collaborative research endeavors, um, what are called environmental competency groups, as a means of trying to make space for, again, situating and redefining climate change knowledge, especially around um, coastal land loss and restoration. So talk a bit about that. Um, so. The environmental competency group methodology, fairly new, um, was pioneered by a group of geographers in the UK who were looking at flood risk. Um, they were doing this research during the 2000s. Um, and for them, as opposed to a kind of framing competency groups as a, a focus group or stakeholder input session, their aim was to bring a diverse group of participants together over a period of time, residents, scientists, environmental managers, property owners, et cetera, around environmental issues or controversies, as they talked about. The intention with bringing together individuals who are not necessarily considered stakeholders and having them come together and meet over, I think, about a span, usually of about a year, two years, some of these initial projects did, um, was to really try and open up the space for what we can call an epistemological or a kind of conceptual shift in understanding what particular environmental issues or controversies are as a collective, as a group. So for them, their focus was on flooding. In this way, competency groups aimed to redefine and redistribute expertise, as a lot of the scholars working on these projects talk about. They wanted to redefine who the experts are and how expertise um, is generated. Right? The competency group method challenges assumptions about the fundamental differences between scientific and experiential knowledge, right? Expert, technical, objective, traditional, local, as some of these other methods we've talked about um, reference, right? And do so not only with an eye towards integrating different forms of knowledge, right? Um, but actually trying to open up a space for reshaping research agendas reflecting the different interests, questions, expertise, and needs of, of the participants in the group. It's a move towards what the initial scholars uh, doing this work in the UK called democratizing public participation in the context of environmental problems, particularly controversial ones. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I, sh am I supposed to have a microphone? I'll run it over. Okay. Actually, I'll just use it to the uh, audience too. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so when you have participatory methods and then this environmental competency groups, um, this format, 
How do researchers go about engaging with, with the public and mm -hmm. identifying who who are or is the best representative for the voice of the community? Because presumably, if we're interested in, in kind of vulnerable populations, not everyone mm -hmm. is going to have the time or the resources to be able to participate fully if something's like a two-year-long process. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, for at least for this methodology, it's not specifically geared towards what we consider to be vulnerable groups, like it could okay. be anybody. Okay. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, but I think with all kinds of things like this, where you're asking of people's times, where some people participate there as a representative of you know, a riverkeeper agency, right? It's their job to be at that versus somebody who's working two jobs and has three kids, and this is just yeah. one of many other things they have to do. Um, you know, those are things, I think on a case-by-case -case basis, um, researchers have to deal with. I know for, you know, for these researchers in the UK, and what I thought was really interesting as well in Louisiana, is that there was this kind of sense of trying to reject the idea of stakeholder, right? Um, so that the individuals who are part of the competency group are there as individuals, right? So it's not as if a black woman represents all black women, right? Or um, somebody working for a water management agency represents everybody in it. The idea is everybody kind of comes to the table with all of their experiences, kind of who they are, but they're really not in their I represent XYZ hat, which is a, a big at least, um, you know, I don't know if you call it like kind of conceptual, but it's kind of a, a theoretical imperative of this methodology, right? They really wanted it to stand apart from just a swath of focus groups. But also the question of like, how do you get people to participate over time? Um, and that's a hard thing to do. Um, I don't know exactly in the context of those environmental competency groups on flooding and then later drought, but for the ones I ran, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, we did compensate everybody for being there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty standard, I think, in social science fields. Um, but part of that also has to do with how you're developing, I think, rapport with people. Um, and that was something that I worked particularly hard on in, in my context. Um, and for these guys, I can't say for sure how they managed to kind of keep them coming because it is, it's a challenge, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's a really, part of what's important about it is that it's not just a one-off meeting, but it's actually kind of a conversation that builds towards a collective goal defined by the group and it takes time to do. Um, so it's not, I don't kind of have like a silver bullet answer to that, but you know, I will talk a little bit about at least the decisions I did and then you know, if we have time in the Q&A, maybe talk about some of those challenges, because it's not all rosy and super easy to do. Um, but yeah, thanks. Um, all right, so I guess I kind of went over a little bit of kind of what these geographers, these British geographers, wanted to do um, with competency groups. And in many ways, um, their project was also kind of philosophical as well as practical. Right. Um, so their goals were ultimately defined by the group themselves, right? So they basically convened a group of people, snowball sampling, things like that, basically to kind of figure out who wanted to be there, who might be the kind of local experts to put in the room. Um, and we're like, all right, flooding, riverine flooding. This is the topic. What is it? How do we understand it? And what kinds of things do we need to produce um, to help people kind of manage these things? And I think this group ultimately came up with creating a website as well as a series of white papers, um, at least for their project. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit, though, about how, how I did mine kind of slightly differently in Louisiana, right? So the first time I ran a competency group was with a group of modelers, ecologists, fishermen, residents, and business owners um, who either all lived and or work in this area, which is St. Bernard Parish, right? So New Orleans is up here. This is the Mississippi River. This is St. Bernard. Um, our goal, um, me and my kind of fellow researchers on the project, um, was to work together to define a modeling framework um, for testing out ideas that were generated by the group for different kinds of wetland restoration projects in these subsiding uh, marshes. Right, so I'll just put that up there while I'm talking. As such, our meeting time was as much spent sharing our understanding of how things like subsidence, for example, in Breton Sound, this is Breton Sound, um, is measured um, to sharing our relative experiences working and studying the area. This meant that fishermen participants would often talk about their ventures and observations on the water as much as modelers would discuss 
their work and the challenges of building their models. These were key moments not only for sharing knowledge, but building rapport and relationships across groups. So during our meetings, I think we had about five or six um, participants would ask questions of each other, right, trying to clarify things like, what is this model, right? How does it operate? Um, what are the date? What's the data being used to set up the baseline models, right? We needed to do two things. We needed to kind of vet, if you will, and collectively agree on a baseline model. And then we came up with different kinds of restoration projects to test in that baseline model. So there was a lot of conversation about, why don't you have this data? Can you get this data? Where is that data set from? Why are you using this one and not this one? Um, a lot of that. These meetings were very uh, iterative, right? So they built on each other, always kind of towards those two main goals. Um, again, with a focus on discussing the ideas and questions of all members of the group in order to, under, to ensure that the model outputs were not only understood by everyone, but also reflected the discussion and input of everybody in the room. Um, certainly not easy to do, and again, I can go more into the, the weeds and details about that. Um, throughout our multi-month meeting process, all the members of the competency group remained interested. They showed up, they were eager to discuss things and understand the modeling process and how ideas from our meetings could be translated into models, which is not an easy thing to do, um, <laughs> as any of you who work with modelers understand. Um, but nevertheless, we, we kept up our kind of regular numbers and we usually met for about three hours at a time. Um, and every time we kind of started a new meeting, basically we reflected on what we did last time, talked about changes to the model, and then start our discussion from there. We used comprehensive interviews at the end of the project to analyze how individual participants felt about this approach. The sense was that diverse perspectives were largely welcome and that everybody's input was taken very seriously, um, which made, in many ways, this process pretty distinct from other public engagement efforts around coastal restoration in Louisiana. And for those of you who don't know, um, you know, there, there is a lot of tension in terms of coastal planning in Louisiana. Uh, it's, it's not an easy topic to breach. Um, and this, this happens in small communities to large cities. Um, so figuring out ways to push through people's research fatigue and not make it feel like yet another public input session um, was certainly a challenge. Um, so for them, um, for many of the participants, at least when we talked to them after, um, they would describe it as less standoffish than typical coastal restoration meetings that bring together scientists and the public. Instead, several members noted that they felt their perspectives and questions were um, respected and heard, um, establishing an environment for mutual exchange. Um, and this, of course, again, allowed for this idea that everybody's ideas mattered, right? And that planning could be about more than just the scientists telling us what to do, right? Which is by and large the sentiment that people feel down there. And is one of the main reasons why I also want to try and figure out ways to, if you will, kind of create a setting where that animosity and acrimonious exchange could be tempered. <laughs> um, the competency group methodology represents a distinct departure, at least in my opinion, from typical community input and engagement methods um, as they're used in coastal restoration planning in at least two ways. First, as I noted before, it insists that environmental problems and solutions are not given, but differently understood and interpreted across groups. Um, in other words, it doesn't assume what a problem is, right, and subsequently solicit solutions. Rather, it makes a space for defining what that problem is in the first place, which in turn can hopefully point towards solutions that are not typically considered uh, when it comes to coastal restoration or other environmental problems. Second. The competency group approach really tries to get away from binaries, right, between communities, planners, and scientists by insisting, as I mentioned before, that everybody participates in the meeting as individuals with the collective goal of addressing an environmental problem from their individual insights and experiences. Um, and then the debates or conversations generated within the space of the group, right? Um, so it's not that the scientists said this and the fishermen said this. It's like, we as a group discuss this. And, and those might seem kind of like minutiae, but they're actually, I think, really important when we're thinking about trying to do work on the ground. And, and again, this is, this is a struggle, I think, for a lot of public engagement efforts around um, coastal and climate change research and planning, right? So go ahead. <laughs> 
Can I have the oh, microphone? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We've got 10 users online. So, um, okay. that's fun. I was just curious because oftentimes you can go into these meetings and the objective may be to talk about environmental decisions and climate change, but oftentimes you're going to talk about other issues. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, were there, were there any issues that consistently came up that maybe needed to be discussed even before you could dive into these issues around climate change and uh, modeling and, and things like that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's one of the, the things, and, and doing this, I think, actually takes pretty adept facilitators. So I think, like, for me, it helped that I had already, I knew a lot of these people, or knew people who knew these people, um, and I had conducted these things after being in Louisiana in these spaces for three or four years. So I wasn't a stranger to a lot of folks. Um, that helps in terms of the kind of personality in dealing with the room because things like this would come up, right? So a lot of fishermen in this particular area are concerned about um, the river being diverted into these marshlands, right? And this has to do with issues around oyster productions and changes to salinity levels because of the inundation of fresh water. And there is what scientists who really advocate for this method of restoring the coast um, call a free river diversion, which is about down here. Um, that broke through basically from a high river event on the Mississippi a number of years back, broke through a levee, has not been repaired yet, so it's been sending significant amounts of fresh water into the marshes in Brenton Sound, impacting salinity levels, and this is a, an area where you have public, the, all the public oystering grounds for the state of Louisiana as well as several private um, oyster ground leases. So that was often a topic that came up. And a lot of these guys were going up and down to the state capitol, trying to advocate to get the core and the state and the private landowners where the levy opened to close it. But a lot of advocates for coastal restoration and who want to see the use of the river to sustain wetlands and combat land loss um, would argue against it because it was free and it was doing like a kind of natural experiment, as they called it, right? So they're like, we have this free diversion. We want to keep it open. This will help us better understand accretion processes in the wetlands, right? River diversions was not the subject of our meetings, right? But people would come in, coming fresh out of council meetings, meeting with public representatives, and they'd just be angry, right? They also knew that several of the people in the room with us, so biologists, modelers, they knew we worked with the state on planning some of these diversion structures. Nobody denied that, you know, we talked about it, and actually we had to spend a lot of time almost working through that before we could even get to what was on all my very meticulously planned agendas for our meetings, right? Um, but, but part of why we let that happen is, is because part of the experiment, at least in doing the, this kind of approach to engagement, is to allow a space for that, um, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't anything new, and actually there ended up being a lot of kind of conversations, if you will, diversions in our in our conversation about how modeling the diversions was going, um, which is something that some folks in the group were, I mean, that was kind of their full-time job. So they would take the time to say kind of what they could and explain how a lot of these um, modeling efforts around them, you know, what the results they were projecting for sediment load as well as salinity levels and impacts to fisheries, what they would be to the extent that they could share it. Um, which I think was ultimately very positive, right? Um, it also kind of broke down this, what tends to be a wall between coastal residents and scientists in Louisiana about, you know, your models don't reflect reality, right? Or the modeler and the models themselves so divorced and happening, you know, 100 miles away from the coast, right? It actually brought our modelers inadvertently right into the room, right into, I mean, we were meeting... Our meetings were all in St. Bernard, too, which helped. Um, so it was, you know, out here. So a good two and a half, three hour drive for a lot of our scientists to get there. Um, you know, we were located right next to a 20 foot tall flood wall. You know, and we were like talking about these issues. And they were like, you guys are doing these things to our communities. And we're really upset about them. And it actually gave a space for folks to talk back. And it was never. I mean, it's hard to say. In Louisiana, like, folks can come off like they're being kind of angry because that's 
just the way Cajuns talk, as they might say. Um, but it was actually really productive, right? And there were several moments, like I didn't have every moment of our meeting structured. So I would give like 30 minutes for everybody to get dinner, sit down, talk to each other, learn something about where they're from, you know, and actually they started like, I dare say starting to like each other towards the, towards the end. And it's like, not that they didn't like each other before, but actually like kind of caring about each other and their stories, which helped tamper back those moments of like, this is really making me angry today. You know, so we could kind of get through that and we were able to move through it quicker after we gave initial space to it to get to what we wanted to do, but not ignoring it. So, you know, it was, you have to be flexible on those things. And I mean, there was no way I was gonna say, that's not what we're talking about because in many ways we are. You know, it points to the fact that folks know and I think are generally very concerned that this world is gonna be transformed out from under their noses by a bunch of people that they have absolutely no connection to. They don't understand what they're doing. Um, and ultimately, that scientists don't value fishermen or folks that live in these communities, which trying to figure out a way to make a space where that could be cultivated and made clear that these scientists are in this work because they do care, at least most of them do. Um, and they want their science to be useful to communities and not make kind of enemies, if you will, with them. So, yeah, <laughs> there, were, there were things. That's the main one that stands out to me. There might have been other things, but uh, for the most part, people were pretty, pretty good. Um, so with that, I just wanted to, to note in terms of this method, too, um, you know, part of that, if you will, kind of description of what would happen is that, you know, in many ways for us, at least I, uh, this was also a challenge between myself and my, my other kind of scientist colleagues. Um, I didn't really see this as a survey or a collection of local knowledge. Um, but again, a kind of space for engagement, right? Um, it wasn't about trying to create buy-in from communities, which is a term that kind of gets thrown around a lot too. Like, how do we convince people to believe our models, right? It wasn't so much about that, but about actually trying to break down what on earth a model is in the first place. And and how it's used and what it can and cannot do, um, and, and how maybe as a group we can think about using them better, especially if the state is already resigned to using them, which it mostly is. Um, you know, to me, this is, I, this is kind of at a, almost at a conceptual level really about, again, what, what are the kind of issues um, that are there in the first place? Um, how can we listen to people to understand what those are? And then how can we use the schools, skills and knowledges we have to deal with that kind of thing, right? So, you know, the idea of developing a collective and shared understanding, you know, you can call it kind of a, a frou-frou or soft kind of thing to do, um, you know, but there is tremendous, there can be a tremendous amount of public opposition and people can stop projects from being built um, when they feel like it's adversarial and they don't understand it. Um, so I feel like it's better to do that on the planning end as opposed to wait, get your permits, start constructing things, have your public hearing meetings, and have local representatives say, my constituents don't want you to build this, so we're not going to give you the permit to do it. Um, I think it's really important, and I also feel like many of the scientists I work with uh, were also very open to this. Um, so it, it was nice to see that kind of collaboration between groups. Um, and I can talk about what we produced, but, you know. I don't want to take up too much time. Oh, here's our lovely group, at least part of them. Um, and then just kind of a breakdown of what we did after each meeting. Um, so just to kind of conclude here, um, one of the reasons why I want to talk about these things is because I also want to try and use these methods and approaches in the research that Teresa and I are going to be doing in Louisiana and in South Carolina. Um, but luckily, we're not exactly bound to do research on any particular topic. So the competency group I did before in Louisiana was oriented towards modeling and restoration projects, but we have a little bit more open of a space for this one. Um, so we're starting to discuss um, what opportunities we might have to develop a competency group in these areas on the topic of climate change, as well as housing and land justice for African-American residents living in coastal areas in these states. Um, 
The goal would ultimately be to identify a cohort of residents and scientists, perhaps from NCAR, hopefully, maybe some of you, um, or from other regional universities or federal state agencies, to first define what the biophysical and social impacts of coastal climate change might be on these communities, right? We have to understand what people think the problem is, um, not just what we think the problem is. Uh, and secondly, to identify what kinds of research might be necessary to confront those challenges, um, particularly as they pertain to issues around housing, um, which is something that came up a lot for me in my field work in Louisiana before, which is why I want to try and focus on it more now. So this is just a rough schedule of what I think we'll be doing. In order to lay the groundwork for this, um, both Teresa and I are conducting participant observation with local groups that work with coastal African-American communities, particularly groups that, again, focus on issues around um, housing, home ownership, land ownership, and things like that. We're also busy collecting uh, existing information on flood risks, climate change planning, demographic, and housing um, for the areas that we plan to focus on. Um, after conducting this pretty extensive background and reconnaissance work and trying to identify community partners, uh, we're aiming to hold these competency groups in South Carolina and Louisiana between fall 2020 and spring 2021. Um, you know, it takes, as many of you or any of you who, who do long-term research, you know it kind of takes time to build trust and, and show kind of that you care about what these communities are doing. So, you know, little by little, we're starting to build these, um, especially because they're new for, for both of us in South Carolina. So hoping to work with groups like the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, um, which is centered in the Low Country in South Louisiana or South Carolina, um, as well as groups that work on issues around um, inherited property, which I've talked to several of you about before. Um, so with that, that's what I have for y'all today. I'm glad to talk more about any of this, but thanks for y'all's attention. I appreciate it. Um, so thanks, that was great. Um, so my question, I have to have a preamble first. So planning, yep. as I said in my talk, is a academic endeavor and a professional field, both. And I think there's a strong tension between academic planners who plan it doesn't really have its own theory, so we draw on economics, sociology, anthropology, and planning theory is kind of a combination of lots of those theories. And it's very, I would say it's a, uh, it's a, it's a set of theory that draws on a lot of the stuff you talked about today. Uh, and tries to be a sort of progressive, forward-thinking approach to, to academia and to practice. The problem is we try to train our students that way in our planning theory classes and talk about ethics and participatory research, and, and we do all of this, and I've done a lot of that work. But then I feel like there's a – you give someone a planning degree, they go out into the field, and they're working for a mayor, <clears throat> a planning director – a federal agency head, whatever, who says, here's your deadline, here's your budget, here's your tasks, you have to get it done. And so a lot of what they learn in the classroom kind of gets thrown out the window a little bit. So I guess what my question with that preamble is, to what degree do you, did you feel uh, buy-in or tension or whatever from the planet, maybe not the scientists maybe also, but particularly the planning officials or the planners that you worked with in some of these endeavors? Yeah. <clears throat> in terms of uh, them sort of drinking the Kool-Aid and being willing to go slowly and to wait and to listen as opposed to, you know, I don't, are you familiar with Sherry Arnstein's ladder of public participation yes. model? All right, so the, you know, at, <laughs> at the very top of the ladder, this is from the 1960s, the very top of the ladder is like complete sort of, you know, the stuff you laid out, participatory action, engaged work. And at the bottom is sort of, uh, I forget what what the term is she uses, but basically, you know, placation or something would be yeah. like, at the, or manipulation is actually at the bottom, but placation is the next step up and there's seven steps. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering from the planners that you dealt with who had these, um, you know, this devil on their shoulder saying, <clears throat> mm -hmm. you have to get this task done by this date to accomplish this thing before you move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. How hard was it to get them to slow down 
listen, digest, iterate, all the things that are necessary uh, to do this kind of work well because I, I've done it. It's slow and sometimes you just never finish and whatever. <laughs> yeah. When you're in our seats, that can happen yeah. a little more easily. Um, but when you have a boss breathing down your neck, um, it's a it's a different world for those planners. And so I'm, I think there's a massive disconnect between what we what we in academia for the most part want to see as a planning practice norm and what actually gets what actually happens on the ground. So I was just curious if that at all was a tension that you experienced. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, and I think well, I'll say two things. I think that focus on slowing down is a big is a big part of all of this, right? And that's part of even, you know, what the geographer is working on. Like, these are like science technology studies geographers too, right? They've been deep in their Haraway and Latour and Isabel Stegners and all those folks that are about, again, slowing down the process of kind of creating knowledge and dealing with environmental issues. And it's hard under a deadline. And actually when I was doing those groups in Louisiana, I had a boss, uh, I was working for a nonprofit research organization, right, that was, that was funding it, which um, was a challenge in terms of those deadlines, right, so for me it was about pushing really hard to, to advocate for even things like you would not believe how long it takes to get gift cards to compensate people. Well, maybe you guys do, no. Um, the fact that, you know, we can get paid every two weeks and the fact that it takes nine months to get a $100 gift card to Walmart is kind of absurd. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there were things like that. There were also things, um, you know, I didn't work, we weren't so much planners, right? So I think the planning side is maybe a little bit different, but we also had, you know, we had to finish the, like, the grants closing out this fiscal year. Like, we need to get all the meetings done, and we need to publish three articles from it. Like, so our last meeting was, like, early October, and they're, like, great, like, drafts of everybody's individual articles due in a month, and then revisions, and then a month later, we're sending them out to journals, considering all the amount of data we collected, right? Because I was doing ethnographic data, right? So we were transcribing meetings, taking notes, doing follow-up interviews, in addition to organizing those meetings. So it was troubling and hard, like, to do that, and I had to, in many ways at least slow down what I could of my own process for it. Um, but then also, um, part of it was even like documenting, like documenting things. So for example, figuring out a way to show in meetings how the conversations we had at the previous meetings were incorporated into how the modelers changed the models, um, which was a very hard thing to get done. We usually had about four or five weeks in between meetings. Um, and the modelers had other projects to work on, so they didn't always have a ton of time to sift through that you know, narrative data and translate it into something that they could put into code or put into their models. Um, and worse off, um, they didn't have a good way of documenting it, which for us was very key, right? Because I didn't want to stand up there in front of a group and say, you know what, we took seriously what you said, and I trust me, this is what you said. But I had no way to show that, so it was... A lot of meetings, at least between myself and our modeling team, to get them to just say, I'm like, how do you take this comment and translate it into something you're tweaking in the model? Um, and they didn't always get it. You know, um, it's, I struggled, especially when we were writing up both kind of our final reports as well as our journal articles, you know. They're like, well, we did this, it was successful, so now everybody trusts our science and understands our models. I was like, well, no, this is 12 people, and you know, <laughs> we have to at least be conscientious of, of the group we're working with and how we can scale these results. Um, and I was also like, I don't know how to say if it builds trust. Is that the point, right? And I think there were moments where I thought we were all on the same page, and then other meetings I come out of and be like, they have no idea why we're doing what we're doing. Um, which was hard. Um, and they didn't have time, you know, to, to have those conversations. So I think planners deal with that similarly. Um, to me, accountability to the process was really important. But I think the span of, like, theory to practice, in many ways, you kind of have to be willing to stand up for it because your colleagues probably won't. And sometimes that means doing extra 
work, <laughs> you know, um, which isn't, some of us have the time, some of us don't, so, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I, I'm fine. I have a strong voice. So I'm just wondering, um, it makes a difference for sure. Uh, anyways, in these small communities, tribal communities, I know there is a survey fatigue or research fatigue, and some yeah. of them are already over-researched. I'm wondering if you encounter that, especially in Louisiana, in those high-risk parishes, they're exposed, and in South Carolina especially, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there are already a number of teams in the field. I'm wondering if there is some creative way that you're considering to try to find different maybe, uh, you know, within the subpopulations, different representatives as a part of your project that maybe uh, can kind of provide a fresh, you know, elements to your research. Yeah. No, I mean, the research fatigue question is always, I think, a hard one. Um, and that's kind of why I like being an anthropologist in many ways, because I can kind of afford myself the time to actually get to know people before starting to make asks of them, uh, because I also know that that's a big task. Um, at least for the recruitment for that group we did in Louisiana, um, you know, I went to a lot of, I probably ended up talking to about 40 people or so um, that I thought could be potential uh, participants and folks who were recommended to me. And I, I mean, I was honest with them. I was like, this is what it's going to be. Like, it's still going to be a meeting. You know, it's, it's they're probably going to be two hours long. It's this time commitment. If you think you can do it, great. If not, you know, cool, I understand you're doing other things or whatever it might be. Um, and I got a lot of people who were like, this is great, but, you know, A, I don't think I have the time for this, or B, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's just a lot of pre-meeting field work, if you will. And I think that's the only way, you know, to do it. And, to, and I was just up front with them, you know, I was like, I'm going to try and not make this boring, you know, um, but... Um, you know, it's luckily folks, when they showed up, you know, we probably had about 20 people show up at the first meeting, talk more about it, and then, you know, subsequently about 15 came back. And I would also see them in between meetings. Like, other, I mean, I had the time to do that, luckily, you know, and I made the argument for that. Like, part of my job is to spend time driving out, visiting with people, working with them in between those meetings. So I think that helped. Um, and also just making sure I was very conscientious of, like, not too many PowerPoints at the meetings because, you know, that's what happens all the time. So, I mean, I wish I had, like, a solid, like, this is the thing you can do, but especially if we're able to do this through our own research grants and on our own terms, I think there's space for that. When you're in the realm of planning or you're working for, like, an NGO or a city government or a state agency, it's, it's different. Um, and I would certainly like the LA Safe program, I think is an interesting counterpoint to that, which if anybody wants to talk more about that at some other point, I'll gladly share my insights from participating in it um, and what I know about the structure of it. But yeah, <laughs> that's it. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Well, thanks, y'all. Appreciate it.